Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 2. We made it all the way to Genesis 2. Yeah. Um, and let me, um, we'll read Genesis 2 verses 1 through 3. And we're going to talk about that tonight as we move forward. Uh, but we'll take a little diversion into the end of the world. The beginning shows the end. And it's just like this, people write books this way. They will preview the ending of the book at the beginning of the book. Or a movie will preview the ending of a movie in the beginning. The, they'll show you the end by the beginning. If you catch on to it, you can see it. And... That's the way the Bible is. It is showing the end from the beginning. So everything that you see, I love, I don't know about you, but I love this earth. I love it. It's beautiful. You know, I come back from Alaska with all these, these things that I've seen and it's just absolutely glorious. And when you look at things like that, or you go to the Grand Canyon and see the Grand Canyon, you go to Niagara Falls and see that, or you... Just see any of the wonders. You fly over the world and see it. And you see that it is a good earth that God has given us. But this is not his best work. There is a better one. Whew. Man, what glory. Amen. Genesis chapter 2. God, give, God created man. He gave man dominion over all the beasts, all the fish, all the birds. All the trees, everything God has given man, dominion and God. If you look at verse 31, the last verse of chapter 1, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And I believe that. I believe it. And there is so much talk. From a lot of people about the age of the earth. That it's millions of years old. Billions of years old. Hundreds, hundreds of millions of years old. And they say they have proof. I don't believe that. I don't believe they do. I, you don't have a camera. Showing me. Time. Past. You don't have, you don't have pictures. I have the word of God telling me how old. This earth is. And that's what I believe. I don't have any reason to believe anything else. So in verse 1 of chapter 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it He had rested from all this work which God created and made. Father, we come before you tonight. I thank you for a good day. I thank you, Lord, for good fellowship with your people. And I thank you, Lord, for gathering us once again today as we study your word, as we glean from it. Lord, we're here to learn. We're here to be blessed and benefited. And that only comes from your word and your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we come before you today. We ask you that you would rise and give us bread. Be our teacher, be our guide, be our preacher. Give us the lessons to learn. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless your people. We thank you, Father, for giving us an example to follow. That example is given in your word. We ask you, Heavenly Father, Lord, to open up our minds and our hearts. We ask you, Father, Lord, to bless your church and that in blessing us, we then would carry the blessings out beyond the walls of this place and be a blessing in our town, our county, our state, our country, be a blessing to people around the world. That's what we want. So, Father, we ask for your guidance tonight. We love you in Jesus name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Uh, I want you to go to, keeping in mind the creation, go to uh, Isaiah chapter 66, last, last chapter of Isaiah. Of course, Isaiah is said that it is a model for the Bible. 
And I think there's some truth to that. Isaiah has 66 chapters, the Bible having 66 books. And one of the things that's interesting to me is that you can go to the 40th chapter of Isaiah and you can see the 40th book of the Bible, the beginning of the New Testament. Because 40th chapter of the book of Isaiah tell, talks about um, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. And it talks about the ministry of John the Baptist where he's going to make, you know, make the rough places plain and the crooked places straight. And he's going to prepare the way of the Lord. And that's exactly what happens in the Gospel of Matthew, the 40th book of the Bible. So there's evidence there. And then when you look at the last chapter of the book of Isaiah, you see sort of a, a, a foreshadowing of the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation. So in Isaiah uh, 66 here, let's see here, where can I find it? Uh, where he talks about the new heavens and the new earth. Ah, verse 22, which is interesting, the book of Revelations, 22 chapters. So, I, I mean, it just, to me, it just fits. So he says in Isaiah 66, 22, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. When God does something, he always does it twice. He sent Jesus once, he's sending him again. God speaketh once, yea, twice. We are born once, we have the chance to be born again. And I'll say this, even those that are lost, and are going to be judged as lost, are going to be resurrected. And it's the second resurrection. There's the fir first resurrection, is, of course, the translation, where we and all the dead in Christ rise up and we're transformed. But after the thousand years, there is a resurrection of the damned. And it's everybody who's lost, turned their back on God. God revives them, gives them a body, that then will be burned in the lake of fire continuously for all of eternity. Wow. So God does everything twice. And he makes this earth and the heavens around this earth. All the host of them, he said in Genesis 2. The host being the stars, the sun, the moon. What we see up in the sky. And all of that, God is going to destroy. He's going to, with fire. It's all going to melt with a fervent heat, the Bible says. I, my theory is this. You know, I, I showed you last weekend about the atoms and how all the, Sterling, the positive charges inside the middle of an atom should all push apart because magnets push apart. But they don't. They're being held together by a force. We don't know what it is, but I do. It's Jesus. By him, all things consist. And I think it's, we, we, man has already learned this, that he can split an atom. And what happens when you split the atom? It's not just the explosion, it's the heat that's caused. Man's already dabbled in that. So I think maybe that at the end of the world, Jesus just lets everything go. Kaboom, and everything melts with a fervent heat. So then, God replaces what he's destroyed. You remember, remember that. If God destroyed something in your life, I promise you, he's going to replace it with something far better. And I'll, I'll, I'll retell this same story. What I wanted was this amazing, life-changing Christian school. I wanted that so bad here. I would walk through the, we had a learning center here, and I would walk through that learning center, and I'd just cry. And I'd say, God, fill these offices. We had plenty of room for a lot of kids. I said, God, fill this place with children that we could train and teach in your ways. And I wanted that so bad. And I would weep over that. And God destroyed it. He took it away. 
He took, even took it out of my heart. The last year we operated that school, that last semester, I wanted nothing to do with it. Rose and Lisa will tell you, they saw me back in those days. And I had Bradley come in here twice a week to fill in for me because I didn't want to be in there anymore. I was burnt out. And God did that. He destroyed that for me. So he could give me something better. And what's better is sitting here and here and here. That's what's better is what God has blessed. So instead of me having this little school with a few children in it that I thought would be this great thing. There's children that listen to this church all over the world now. Four of them. I'll never get over that. So what God gave me in its place, I'm telling you, is far better. Um, on my door is a testimony of that. Because all the little children that come here to visit, if they draw me a picture, I hang it on my door. And so last, remember the Oklahoma girls, the amen corner? They've all got pictures hanging on my door. Okay, those kids, they're homeschooled, they listen to Pastor Mike during the week. So what God gave me was better than what I had. What I, it's better than what I asked for. Amen? So now turn to, uh, by, well, let me show you this in verse 23. In Isaiah 66, it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another... Shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Now, I'm going to say this. It looks to me like there is a measurement of time. It looks to me like that. He's talking about one new moon because we know the moon's, the moon isn't going to be for what it's used for now. Right now, the moon lights up the night. But in that place, there is no night. So the moon seems to have a different purpose. It's still eternal. It's going to be forever. But it's going to have a different function. From one new moon to another. From one Sabbath to another. Uh, Shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And verse 24 gives us a glimpse of the lake of fire. They shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm, this is what Jesus was quoting. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. And I think that is the lake of fire. And I think God allows us to see that, to say for eternity, we could have been in there. But we weren't. By the grace of God, we're not there. Amen. Now, Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Oh, I love this. So, I, verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more, what? Sea. Salt and the sea water is a picture of burning, I believe. Salt burns. You rub salt on a wound, it burns. And I think it's a picture of, of burning, of fire. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Somebody say amen. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's how good God is to us. I'm telling you. What God has destroyed out of your life, he will rebuild something way better than it ever was. Verse 5, and he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. I mean, you had a new start today. Yesterday is gone. You have never lived today before. Tomorrow's coming. You have never lived tomorrow but you will tomorrow and you will have that new chance we go to sleep at night and we wake up and we'll have that new chance to live for God and to serve him and to study his word and to do things for him and he when he says he makes all things new he is not 
kidding. We learned in Sunday school this morning that the inner man is renewed every day. Every day. That inner man is renewed in us. Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Look at that. We are sons of God. Just like Adam. Luke chapter 3, Adam is called the son of God. So we now are the new Adam. We're the new sons of God. Uh, look at verse uh, 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable and murderers and whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters and all liars. There's eight things there. And we're in verse 8. Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that's what we just read in Isaiah 66. It'll be an abhorring. Why eight things? Eight is a number for like a new start, a new beginning. In Genesis 8, eight people walk off the ark to a new world. So in this case here, it represents the resurrection of the lost. And eight types of people. Like the Antichrist is the eighth. All right. So um, let's see here. Uh, there's the measurement of the city of God. Uh, look at verse 22. And I saw no temple therein for the Lord God almighty and the lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. But I do believe there will be a sun and a moon. It's just not needed for the glory of the Lord did lighten it. And the lamb is the light thereof. It's just like you go back in Genesis one. When God said, let there be light, what was the source of the light if the sun, the moon, and the stars hadn't been created by then? It was God was the source of that light. So now we have it again. It's like everything that God did in Genesis 1 is now being magnified. Where back then it was temporary. Now this is everlasting. Um, oh, look at verse um, 24. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Because in old time, they would shut the gates at night. In the walled cities, they would shut the gates at night to keep out robbers and thieves and invaders and everything else. For there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. I hope your name is written in that book. Amen. I hope your name is written in that book. Now chapter 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. Can you imagine that? Water, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And then he goes on to talk about all of that. But it, basically, this is the new heaven and the new earth that God is going to make. And it's going to be better than this one. Way. If God said that this one was very good, what would he say about the new one that he's going to make? Outstanding. Awesome. Amazing. I don't think there's enough words to describe how that's going to be. But it's going to be, listen, all the trials and things that we go through, it's going to be worth it. So, but basically now we're back in Genesis chapter two. So turn there. And God is establishing something for the benefit of his creation. And it's actually not just for the benefit of man. It's for the benefit of all of his creation. I have another piece of this old Bible coming off here. Yeah, this thing is pretty, pretty tattered. But anyway, um, in, in the Old Testament law, God even wanted the land to have a Sabbath. And I've known or I've heard of farmers who would Sabbath their land. They would plant crops for six years and let it rest on the seventh. And just the way God instructed the Israelites to do. Because one of the things that uh, I was watching a documentary about 
farmers who would, who would farm out a land and they would wear what they would, they called it wearing out the land. They would farm a piece of land, grow crops on it, and never replenish the nutrients in the soil. And then all of a sudden, they plant a crop and it doesn't grow. And that land basically has become useless to them. And it's because they did not follow God's commandments. They did not replenish the earth because you have to put the nutrients back in because you've pulled the nutrients out by growing your corn or your wheat or your cotton or whatever it is you're growing. And you took that out. That has to be replenished somehow, some way. And they would wear out a piece of land and they'd have to go find some other place to farm because that land was no good anymore. And that land had to be replenished. So I've heard of farmers doing things God's way and they said it always worked. Imagine that, amen? But we're going to learn about the Sabbath and what it's all about. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them, and on the seventh day. And this is where we get the meaning for the number seven, right here. The seventh day God ended his work. So the number seven represents God finishing things. It's done, it's over, it's, there's no more added to it. God ended his work which he had made. He rested on the seventh day. So that's another meaning. and That's another implication of the number seven. He rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. You know, the question is, was God tired? No. God doesn't get tired. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't rest. But he rested here as an example to man. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. So there's another Interpretation in their December, number seven, sanctification. When you are sanctified, you are completely sanctified by God. Holy. Nothing to be added to the sanctification of God. You were baptized Roman Catholic, right? How much, how much of that did you learn as a, as a child, as a person? Okay. Didn't like the incense and the chanting. Gave you the creeps, the willies, right? Yeah. No way. Italians had their own Catholic church, huh? Man. Talk about racist. Good night. But anyway, the idea of the Catholic Church is you're not totally sanctified by God. Christ doesn't totally sanctify you. You must sanctify yourself by works. Prayer beads, walking on your knees, giving money, or whatever it is. You're not totally and completely sanctified. And yet, the doctrine of the Bible teaches that when Christ covers you from your guilt, there's nothing left of it. It's full and complete. So God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because that, and how many spirits are there? Seven. Seven spirits of God for sanctification, because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So now turn to Exodus 20. So that basically is what the law of the Sabbath was based upon. It was based upon Genesis chapter 2 and what God said. So we go to the 70th chapter of the Bible and there we find the Ten Commandments. Imagine that. So Exodus 20 verse 8. God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, I've taught on this before and I'm going to do it again. I've experienced this firsthand. God meant what he said in his law. He gave us a day to rest. And I submit to you, brethren, that you ought to do exactly what God said to do on that day. I think you ought to rest. Okay, I do. Now, do we break the law? Yes, we are not keepers of the law. But when we understand that that law benefits us, and there are great I mean, there are even obvious blessings that come from keeping God's law. Who, who among us here would really like to be arrested and put in jail for 120 days? Anybody? 
Thou shalt not steal. So if any of you kids go down to this gas station down here and steal something down there and they come and arrest you, you might have to spend 120 days in jail for that. See the benefit from keeping the law? There's a direct benefit for not stealing, not bearing false witness. There's a benefit to not committing adultery. There's a benefit to not murdering somebody. The benefit is he's still alive. <laughs> And you're not going to prison. You're not being executed for it. So there's a direct benefit for keeping God's word. And in this case here, there's a benefit to us and the bodies that God has given us. God intends for us to rest. Even, and I had to learn this, even in the ministry. Rest. Take a day. Rest. I broke the Sabbath last Saturday. My ox was in the ditch. I had to pull it out or whatever. I, I mean, yeah, I understand we had to do things last Saturday. But normally, and this is something God has just dealt with me about. Normally, on Saturday, I'm left alone, literally. My wife takes her mother shopping. They've been doing that ever since before I met her. And Saturday, basically, I am left alone. To myself I sometimes I would come to the church do some work sometimes I would you know do whatever for the church and God dealt with me about that Mike you've got six days use them but I gave you a day to rest rest did not even Jesus rest himself did he not retreat at times and get away from everybody he did that that was his humanity showing forth. So God said, remember the Sabbath day. And this is what, when somebody calls me to argue about Seventh-day Adventist teachings, Ellen White, whatever, this is what I go to. And I say, let's read the law now and let's figure out what God told us to do concerning the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath to keep, day to keep it holy. Now he's going to tell us how to remember that day. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. If you've got it to do, you've got six days to do it in. And if six days isn't enough, then you'll do it. You've got another six days to do it in. So you'll get an endless supply, Brother Sterling, of six days to do what you need to do. But rest on the seventh day. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant. And, and see, I would like what God's doing here. God's telling even the rich, the wealthy, rest on the Sabbath. And oh, by the way, so must your servants rest on the Sabbath. That means you can't tinka, tinka, tinka the bell. And have them come running to you. Yes, master, what do you want me to do? Nothing, it's the Sabbath day. I want you to take a day off. Nor thy cattle. Don't eat, you're not even, see the Sabbath benefits even the cattle. There's a, there's a passage in the scripture. I'm going to butcher it real bad because I don't have it memorized. But it has something to do with, with the animals, the livestock that you own and how you take care of them. It's, I think it's in the book of Proverbs or something like that. But it says that it's wise to treat your animals right. They're the ones doing the labor. You better take good care of them and treat them well. So there's a wisdom in that. Nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. And hallowed it. Hallowed means made holy. It is a holy day unto the Lord. Now, is there anything wrong with reading the Bible on the Sabbath day? Oh, no. Is there anything wrong in praying on the Sabbath day? Is there anything wrong with healing on the Sabbath day? Oh, Jesus did it. Is there anything wrong with grabbing husks of 
corn and rubbing it together. No, Jesus did that. Okay? And the reason why Jesus did that was to give the, those Pharisees, those religious idiots, and that's what they were. They were knuckleheads. They had devised so many outlandish commentaries and loopholes on the law that the law was of none effect. Jesus told them, by your traditions, you made the law of none effect. And you've built in these loopholes. Sabbath day journey type stuff. You can only walk so far on the Sabbath day. So what they do is they walk so far and sit down and rest and then pick their stuff up and walk another one and sit down and rest. They had built these loopholes so they could get out of not obeying what God said. And they did realize the law didn't need man's help, didn't need man's traditions, and the law was made to directly benefit man. So why not obey the law? Why not keep the Sabbath? Why not just rest on that day and not do it? There's nothing wrong with that. Take a day and rest from your labor. Matthew 12, turn there. This is the very story I was referencing. Matthew 12. Verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. Um, understand corn the way we have it in America. It was actually a South American product. And it was hybridized. Um, there's some speculation as to how the Central South American natives figured out how to modify or whatever it was to make these big ears of what we call corn or maize. But it wasn't referring to what he's saying here, pluck the ears of corn and eat it. It was more like it wasn't the corn that we have now, like cobs of corn. It was ears of grain of some kind. Maybe barley or something like that. Something to where they could take it and eat it right off the stalk. All right. So that's what they did. Jesus went out on the Sabbath day through the corn. And his disciples were in hunger and he began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Well, I like these religious do-gooders who are monitoring everybody else. Oh, they're, they're violating the law. I caught them doing it. Verse 3, But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was hungered? And they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priest and the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? How did they do that? There had to be a continual offering. Huh? Yeah. They had to, every day, a priest had to get up, four o'clock in the morning, whatever, and bake 12 fresh loaves of bread to place on the table. And at the end of the day, those, those loaves were removed and distributed to the priests. They were eaten. And the next day, 12 more on that table, including on the Sabbath day. A priest would have to get up early in the morning, bake the loaves of bread. They would have to be placed on the table, the old bread coming off of that. And he said, they did that on the Sabbath day. So how is it that they did these things on the Sabbath day and yet God did not lay it to their charge? So he said in verse 6, But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Boy, can you imagine that making them mad? And see, we, didn't we just read that from, from uh, Revelation? That in the new heaven and new earth and the new Jerusalem, there is no need for the temple for God himself. And his son is the temple. And that's what he said here. There is one here greater 
than your temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. You can imagine the hatred then that they had for him at this time. They were all about, I'm not kidding you, they were the law monitors. It's like the kid at school. I don't know if you remember the days in school when the teacher had their pet watch the class while the teacher went off to smoke or something. And that kid was always waiting to turn me in. I hated that kid. Except for when I was that kid. And then I couldn't wait to write names down. Mr. Brown, he was talking, he was chewing gum, I caught him. I didn't realize that that's not the way you make friends. I didn't, I didn't understand that. But that's what they were doing. They were waiting for somebody to, they were waiting, especially with Jesus' disciples, they were waiting for them to fail. So they could point it out. And Jesus said, you don't understand. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Now there's a, several meanings behind that. One of which is the Sabbath is the 1,000 year reign of Christ on this earth. A thousand years. Um, there was a story came out today in Tanzania, which is the country south of Kenya. Somebody blew up, killed a bunch of 60 some odd people some sort of tribal dispute down there okay that happens happens in Kenya happens in other places of the world where one group of people hate another group of people but for a thousand years none of that's gonna happen because we're gonna be the police amen we're gonna be the police John we're gonna come back and rule and reign over this earth what part do you want I want Alaska. <laughs> I'm going back. Whether the sweetie pie is going or not, I'm going back. I want Alaska, all right? But we're going to get to rule and reign with Jesus to make sure that nobody's killing each other. There's not going to be any wars anymore. It's going to, this world is going to rest from all of its turmoil. Amen. Amen. Matthew 12, verse 10. Look at this. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. You've seen people like that, right? Maybe a stroke. They've had some sort of paralyzing or they have palsy. Or maybe a node on their brain, something that's not working right. And so their hand is drawn in. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? That they might accuse him. See, they're the hall monitors. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it, lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth and it was restored whole like as the other. That hand is a picture of the New Testament. This person is a Jew and that's a, to me it's a picture of Israel. Their New Testament's withered but it's going to be restored. They're going to understand it now. Jesus did this. So think now take all these things and apply them to the 1,000 year reign of Christ. Will we need health insurance? No. Why won't we? The King of Kings and Lord of Lords is going to be ruling over the earth. The devil is literally bound up in chains in the bottomless pit. All the devils that have fought on his side are cast into prison. There is no tempter. And, no, and if you look and study the life of Jesus, oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes when he healed somebody, he did so by casting out a devil. Now, I'm not saying that every disease is a devil, but I bet you there's a lot of them that are. 
And all these devils now are gone. There are no devils on the earth doing what they're doing now. Amen. Causing people to be sick. Causing diseases. Stirring up strife among people. And getting people to blow one another up. And causing people to go to war. And all of these things are vanished for a thousand years. Literally. I think there's not going to be any need of hospitals. Amen. For a thousand years years wow mark chapter oh it finally fell that little piece of that hanging piece of that bible finally had its last breath mark chapter 2 turn there this is a little bit different version of the same story Mark chapter 2, verse 23, and it came to pass that when he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn, and the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? He said unto them, Have you never read what David did? When he had need, and he was hungered, he and they that were with him. How he, and now he's going to tell what David did. And the last part he didn't. Now he's going to tell how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and did eat the shoe bread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest, and gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So now you have another thing added to the same story, which is why if you read one gospel, read another one. Because they're not exactly the same. They're going to give you some of the details. But here's Jesus saying, look, you need to understand. In your law mind, in your law books, the Sabbath was given as a benefit. You're using it as a curse. Which is exactly... You people in Kenya, listen to me. The Seventh-day Adventists are all over you over there trying to tell you that you're breaking the law and that you have the mark of the beast on you because you went to church on Sunday and the Bible says nothing about that. Not one word. But that's what they're telling you. They're telling you that you're breaking the Sabbath because you don't go to church on the Sabbath day. And yet, there is nothing in the Scriptures about mandatory church attendance on the Sabbath day. Not one word. The commandment was to rest. Ellen White turned it into a curse, saying that if you don't go to church on Sabbath day, you've got the mark of the beast on you and you're cursed. And you don't understand the law. You don't understand the purpose behind it. It's to benefit man. The unions want to take credit for giving, giving the American workers two days off. That was God that did that. Not the unions. God gives man a day to rest. And I think you ought to rest. I mean, we, we could probably take testimonies from people. And I've told you mine. People who run their own business. And they'll work, and they'll work, and they'll work, and they'll work. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, Melissa? What happens when you don't take a day off every now and then? What happens? You, tired, sick, what you're wanting to accomplish, you won't accomplish because your mind and your body cannot keep up with it. It literally is a benefit to take a day of rest. And he meant what he said. The Sabbath was made for man's benefit. And I would say that same thing applies to all, again, to all the other laws. It benefits us to only have one God. That way you won't forget any of them. There's only one. Benefits us directly to not pray to idols because then you don't bring down the wrath of God on you. Benefits man directly by not cursing God's name or using God's name in a wrong way. There's benefits here. And then all the other laws honoring you. Hey, is there benefits in honoring your father and mother? Amen. They'll buy you stuff. <laughs> They'll buy you ice cream. Okay. So there's benefits in that, in keeping the laws of God. Then, when you take into consideration the fact 
that it was a blessing to God when you did that which was right. And God, when God blesses something, He blesses it. Amen? Mark chapter 3. We'll end, let's see here, how much more do I got? Man, I got a bunch of stuff on the Sabbath. We'll wait. Luke, Mark chapter 3, verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? To save life or to kill? They held their peace. They didn't know how to answer that. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, I understand that. He saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Again, a little bit different details here. Because now he's asking those guys that specific question. It, tell me, tell me, give me an answer here. On the Sabbath day, should I kill somebody or should I give somebody life? Tell me what to do here. Should I do something good on the Sabbath day or should I do something bad on the Sabbath day? Tell me what the answer is. And they didn't have an answer. They were all about accusing the disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself on one little thing that they thought he did wrong. Rather than looking at their own wretched lives. Amen. Take a day. Now, sometimes a work schedule will have you working on Saturday. I don't have a problem with you making another day a Sabbath. I don't have, if, if your work schedule has you working Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday... You get a day off. Make Wednesday your rest day. Rest. Don't show up for work. Rest on that day. Relieve your mind. Relieve your body. Give it the rest from what you're doing. Give it the rest that it needs so that you can be refreshed to go back and start it all over again. It makes sense, doesn't it? So I just encourage you, you know, this is pretty much what I do. On Saturday. Not much. Lisa would come home and ask me, what'd you do today? Not really much of anything. Okay? Take a day. Take a day. Rest yourself. God gave it to you as a gift. There's a benefit in it.